Three times, Yahweh defeated other gods. Number one, Egyptian plagues connected to defeating an Egyptian god. In the old days of Egypt, with huge pyramids reaching up high and the Nile River giving life, God showed his amazing power. It was like a big showdown between God and lots of other gods. God showed up to Moses in a bush that was on fire but didn't burn up. God spoke to Moses. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have in fact seen the affliction, suffering, desolation of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, oppressors, for I know their pain and suffering. God told Moses to go back to Egypt to lead the Israelites from slavery to a place full of milk and honey. Moses didn't feel ready and doubted himself. God promised to be with him and show his power. Moses and his brother Aaron then faced Pharaoh and said, Exodus chapter five, verse one. After this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. However, Pharaoh said no. He made the Israelites work even harder, which made their lives miserable. Even with Pharaoh being so hard-headed, God assured he would save the Israelites. He said, Exodus chapter 3, verse 20, So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go. This was the beginning of the ten plagues. These plagues were not just bad things happening. They showed God's wrath and were a challenge to the Egyptian gods and Pharaoh's rule. Connection to the Egyptian gods. First plague, water turned to blood. In the story from the Bible, God showed his power over Hapai. Hapai was thought to be the god of the Nile River by the ancient Egyptians. They respected him a lot because they believed he was behind the Nile's flooding every year. This flooding was super important because it made the land by the river very good for growing food. Hapai was seen as more than just a water god. He was also a sign of good luck and wealth. People often pictured him as a man with a big belly, showing he was about abundance, and he was sometimes shown with water plants to show how the Nile could bring life. When God made the Nile River turn into blood, it was a big deal. It wasn't just a challenge to Hapai, but also hit at the heart of what made Egypt rich and alive. Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 through 21. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He lifted his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile. And all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians couldn't drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. The story of the first plague of Egypt is a story about how God sent a terrible disaster to Egypt to free the Israelites from slavery. In the land of Egypt, the Israelites were slaves, and Moses was chosen by God to lead them to freedom. But Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, refused to let them go. So, God decided to show his power to convince Pharaoh. God told Moses, Exodus chapter 7, verses 15 through 16, Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water, and wait for him on the bank of the Nile. And you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, so that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. But Pharaoh didn't listen. God showed his power through Moses. He instructed Moses to use his staff to change the waters of Egypt into blood, including the Nile River and all water sources. This act was to show that the God of Israel was more powerful than any Egyptian God, especially those linked to the Nile. This event was the first of 10 plagues God sent to free the Israelites from Egypt. Even after this terrifying event, the Pharaoh's heart was still hard. He did not let the Israelites go. So, this was only the start of more plagues that would happen in Egypt. However, these are not the only gods Yahweh defeated. To watch other times Yahweh defeated other gods, stay till the end of this video. Second plague, frogs. God targeted Hecate, 
the frog-headed goddess of fertility. Hecate was another god that God targeted during the plagues in Egypt. She is usually shown with a frog's head. People thought she was the goddess of having babies and getting pregnant. In Egyptian stories, frogs stood for life and being able to have lots of babies because they'd laid so many eggs. So, Hecate was honored as a sign of life starting and was believed to have special powers to keep women safe and help them when they were giving birth. Now, let's talk about how Hecate is related to the second plague in Egypt. The story of the second plague starts when Pharaoh still refuses to let the Israelite slaves go free. God then instructs Moses to warn Pharaoh of the consequences. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, so that they may serve me. However, if you refuse to let them go, hear this. I am going to strike your entire land with frogs. Aaron, Moses' brother, stretches his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs swarm the land. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. Exodus chapter 8, verse 6. They thought frogs were lucky because of Hecate, who was all about fertility and blessings. But then, frogs were everywhere, making a mess in their houses and lives. It was like the frogs went from being a sign of good luck to a big problem. This frog disaster showed that the god of the Israelites was way stronger than the Egyptian gods, even in things like fertility that the Egyptians cared about a lot. It was a clear message to the Pharaoh and all of Egypt that their gods couldn't stand up to the god of Israel. But even with this huge sign right in front of him, Pharaoh didn't change his mind. He kept being stubborn, and that meant even more trouble was coming their way. The river shall swarm with frogs, and they shall come into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed. Exodus chapter 8, verses 2 through 4. The frogs were everywhere, in houses, bedrooms, on people, in ovens, and even in the kneading bowls used for making bread. It was a massive invasion of frogs, making life very difficult for the Egyptians. Pharaoh, troubled by this plague, called Moses and Aaron and asked them to pray to God to take the frogs away. He promised that he would let the Israelites go if the frogs were removed. The Bible says, And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Exodus chapter 8, verse 8. Moses prayed to God, and God did as Moses asked. The frogs died out in the houses, courtyards, and fields. The Egyptians had to pile up the dead frogs in heaps, and the land smelled terrible. Once the frogs were gone, Pharaoh changed his mind and didn't let the Israelites go. This led to more plagues as a consequence of his stubbornness. This story of the second plague is about how God used natural creatures like frogs in extraordinary numbers to demonstrate his power and to convince Pharaoh to free the Israelites from slavery. Third plague, gnats or lice. Geb was an important deity in ancient Egyptian mythology, respected as the god of the earth. He was often depicted as a man lying beneath the sky goddess, representing the earth. Geb was not just the god of the physical earth, but also had a role in agriculture, fertility, and the underworld. He was seen as a father figure to plants and crops, and it was believed that earthquakes were his laughter. Now, Relating Geb to the third plague of Egypt from the Bible, we see a significant connection. The third plague directly confronts Geb's domain. God had Moses and Aaron go talk to Pharaoh again, but Pharaoh was still being stubborn. So, God had a new plan that was all about showing Geb who's really in charge. God told Moses to have Aaron hit the ground with his stick. Aaron did just that, and wow, something amazing happened. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground, and it will become biting gnats, lice, throughout the land of Egypt. They did so. Aaron stretched out his hand and with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were biting gnats on man and animal. All the dust of the land became gnats through all the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. When Aaron strikes the ground, 
The dust transforms into gnats or lice. The sudden change from dust to swarming insects is a direct challenge to Geb. It shows that the God of Israel has power over the earth, which is Geb's realm, turning it into a source of discomfort instead of life and growth. Egyptian magicians who could mimic the previous plagues try to produce gnats themselves but fail. Realizing the magnitude of what has happened, they say to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Exodus chapter 8 verse 19. However, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened and he does not heed their words or the sign of power from the God of Israel. The third plague is significant because it's not just a demonstration of God's power over the natural world, but it's also a symbolic defeat of Geb, the Egyptian god of the earth. The inability of the Egyptian magicians to replicate this plague further emphasizes the unique and supreme power of the god of Israel. The plague of gnats is more than just a nuisance. It's a display of God's power, showing that he controls even the smallest elements of creation. The Egyptians, who worship many gods, are shown that their gods are powerless against the God of Israel. Fourth plague, flies. Kepri is an ancient Egyptian god often associated with creation, the movement of the sun and rebirth. His name is linked to the Egyptian word Keper, meaning to develop or to come into being. Kepri is usually depicted as a scarab beetle or as a man with a scarab for a head, symbolizing creation and rebirth. In Egyptian mythology, scarab beetles roll dung into balls from which they emerge, symbolizing new life and regeneration. Kepri was believed to roll the sun across the sky each day, expressing the idea of the rising sun and renewal each morning. Now, relating Kepri to the fourth plague of Egypt. The fourth plague, described in the Bible in the book of Exodus, involves a swarm of flies. This plague came after Pharaoh again refused to let the Israelite people go. The story begins with God instructing Moses to rise early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and warn him of the coming plague. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 21. Unlike the previous plagues, where the Israelites in the land of Goshen also suffered, this time God makes a distinction. The land of Goshen, where the Israelites live, is spared, emphasizing that God is protecting his people. This distinction is significant and is highlighted in Exodus chapter 8, verses 22 through 23. And I were set apart on that day, the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies will be there, in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. I will put a division, distinction, between my people and your people. By tomorrow the sign shall occur. Exodus chapter 8, verses 22 through 23. The plague of flies is a direct challenge to the Egyptian god Kepri. By sending a plague of flies, God is showing his power over Kepri, the god of creation and rebirth, symbolized by the scarab beetle. The swarm of flies, a pest and a nuisance, stands in stark contrast to the revered scarab, undermining the power and authority of Kepri in the eyes of the Egyptians. Despite the seriousness of the plague, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened, and he continues to refuse to let the Israelite people go. Then God did what he said he would. He sent a huge number of flies all over Egypt. These flies were everywhere, in houses, on people, and all over the land. It was terrible for the Egyptians, but interestingly, the area where the Israelites lived, Goshen, had no flies at all. This showed that God was protecting his people. Pharaoh, troubled by this plague, called Moses and Aaron, he said, go, sacrifice to your God here in the land. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, go, 
sacrifice to your God here in the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 8, verse 25. But Moses said it wasn't right to do that in Egypt. So Pharaoh agreed to let the Israelites go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to their God. However, he asked Moses to pray for the removal of the flies first. Moses prayed to God, and God removed the flies from Egypt. But once the flies were gone, Pharaoh changed his mind again and didn't let the Israelites go. This story from the Bible shows how God was trying to help the Israelites and prove his power to the Egyptians while Pharaoh kept resisting. Fifth Plague, Death of Livestock. God targeted Hathor, goddess of love and protection, often depicted as a cow. Hathor is a significant deity in ancient Egyptian mythology, known as the goddess of love, beauty, music, and protection. She was a woman with the head of a cow, or a woman wearing a headdress of cow horns and a sun disk. This imagery symbolizes fertility, motherhood, and the nurturing aspects of nature. Hathor was respected not only as a protective goddess, but also as one representing joy and feminine love. She was also associated with the afterlife, providing guidance and protection to the souls entering the next world. Now, relating Hathor to the fifth plague of Egypt, as mentioned in the Bible, gives us a deeper understanding of the symbolism behind this event. In this stage of the story, God continues to demand through Moses that Pharaoh release the Israelites from slavery. When Pharaoh refuses, God warns of a severe consequence, a plague that will specifically target the livestock of Egypt. God causes a severe disease to affect all the livestock of the Egyptians. This includes horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats. They all die from the disease. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous moraine, and the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children's of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land, and the Lord did that thing on the morrow. And all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Exodus chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. The death of the livestock was a significant blow to the Egyptian economy and daily life, as these animals were essential for labor, transportation, and agricultural processes. Symbolically, targeting the cattle was a direct challenge to Hathor, the cow goddess, showing the supremacy of the God of Israel over the Egyptian deities. Despite the adverse effect of the plague and its impact on Egypt, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened. He still refuses to let the Israelites go, setting the stage for more plagues to follow. In this context, the fifth plague is not just a physical calamity, but also a symbolic act, demonstrating the powerlessness of Egyptian gods like Hathor in the face of the God of Israel's might. It's a key part of the larger narrative of the Exodus where each plague serves a specific purpose in challenging Egyptian ideology and showcasing the sovereignty of the God of the Israelites. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. Exodus chapter 9, verse 7. This story shows how God was demonstrating his power and making it clear that he was protecting the Israelites. Despite the devastating loss of their animals, Pharaoh's stubbornness continued, leading to more plagues. Sixth Plague, Boils. Isis, in ancient Egyptian mythology, is a goddess known for her roles as a healer, protector, and the one who is assumed to bring peace. She was one of the most important and popular deities throughout the history of ancient Egypt. Isis was revered not only as a goddess of medicine and peace, but also as a symbol of magic, motherhood, and fertility. She was often depicted as a caring mother figure, which made her a deity people would turn to in times of trouble, especially for health-related issues. Now, relating to the sixth plague of Egypt. The sixth plague is narrated in the book of Exodus, chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. It comes after Pharaoh continually refuses to let the Israelites leave Egypt. 
God instructed Moses and Aaron to grab some ash from a furnace and then have Moses throw it into the air while Pharaoh was watching. The soot becomes fine dust over the land of Egypt and causes intense boils to break out on the people and animals throughout the land. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. Exodus chapter 9, verse 10. This plague is significant for several reasons. First, it is a direct challenge to the Egyptian gods of health and healing, including Isis, who is revered as a goddess of medicine. The inability of Egyptian gods to protect the people from this plague further demonstrated the power of the God of Israel. Second, it's notable that even the Egyptian magicians, who had tried to replicate previous plagues, were afflicted by the boils and could not stand before Moses because of them, as mentioned in Exodus chapter 9, verse 11. Despite this terrible plague, Pharaoh's heart remained hard, and he still refused to let the Israelites go. This was part of God's plans to show his power and make his name known in Egypt. The sixth plague, like the other plagues, serves to illustrate the power of God and the futility of opposing his will as well as the specific challenge to the Egyptian gods, including Isis, in her role as a healer. Seventh plague, Hail. Not as a key figure in ancient Egyptian mythology, known as the goddess of the sky, she is often depicted as a woman arching over the earth, representing the sky. Nut is considered the mother of the sun, moon, and stars, literally embodying the heavens. Her body was thought to create a protective barrier over the earth. Each morning, Nut gave birth to the sun, which would then travel across her body during the day before being swallowed at sunset, and then reborn the next morning. This imagery reflects the Egyptians' understanding of the day and night cycle. Nut was also seen as a mother figure to several other gods in Egyptian mythology, including Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Her role as a mother to both the celestial bodies and significant deities emphasizes her importance in the Egyptian pantheon. Now, introducing the seventh plague of Egypt in the context of Nut. The seventh plague, as described in the Bible in the book of Exodus, is a direct challenge to Nut's domain. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 18 through 26, God tells Moses to stretch out his hand towards the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt on people, animals, and plants. Before this plague happened, God warned Pharaoh through Moses. Moses told Pharaoh what would happen if he didn't let the Israelites go. This passage reads, Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Exodus chapter 9, verse 18. When Moses stretches out his staff, the Lord sends thunder, hail, and fire to the earth. This severe hailstorm devastated Egypt, destroying crops, livestock, and even people who were caught outside. The hail is mixed with fire, which would have been particularly terrifying and seen as a sign of divine wrath. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, very heavy, such as there had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Exodus chapter 9, verse 24. The seventh plague, a severe hailstorm, challenges the Egyptian sky goddess Nut. By controlling the weather so drastically, God shows his supremacy over Egyptian gods. The hailstorm, rare and extreme from Egypt, symbolizes God's power. Only Goshen, where the Israelites lived, was spared. Pharaoh, witnessing the destruction, admitted his wrongdoing and recognized God's righteousness. He promised to release the Israelites if the hail ceased. However, after Moses prayed and the storm ended, Pharaoh broke his promise, continuing the Israelites' bondage. This event, like the others, was to demonstrate to Pharaoh and the Egyptians that the God of the Israelites is the ultimate authority. Despite the plague's devastation, Pharaoh's stubbornness leads to more calamities, emphasizing the themes of divine dominance and judgment in the Exodus story. Eighth Plague, Locusts, Set, 
A key figure in ancient Egyptian mythology was the god of storms, chaos, violence, and foreigners. He was often shown as a creature with an unusual head that people sometimes thought looked like an aardvark, a donkey, or a mix of different animals. Set was a complicated character. Even though he was linked to chaos and even as a bad guy, especially when fighting with the god Horus, Set also had a protective side. He was called the Lord of the Desert and was praised for his strength in battles and for protecting the sun god Ra from the snake Apophis during Ra's night journey. When we talk about the biblical plagues in Egypt, Set's role as the god of storms becomes very important with the eighth plague. Bible in the book of Exodus tells us that the eighth plague brought a huge swarm of locusts. God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and warn him about the next plague. Moses said to Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. Exodus chapter 10 verse 3. Moses told Pharaoh that if he didn't let the Israelites leave, God would send a huge swarm of locusts. These locusts would eat up all the plants and trees that had survived the earlier disasters. Pharaoh's advisors, who were really worried after seeing how bad the earlier plagues were, told him he should just let the Israelites go. But Pharaoh only wanted to let the men go. Moses and Aaron said no to that because God wanted everyone, kids, women, and even animals, to leave Egypt. God had Moses go back to Pharaoh to do more amazing things. God made Pharaoh's heart tough on purpose. He did this to show off his power, and so the Israelites would always remember and talk about what he did in Egypt. Since Pharaoh wouldn't listen, God told Moses to raise his hand over Egypt. When Moses did that, God made a wind blow in locusts. These locusts covered the whole country and ate all the plants and trees left from the other plagues, like the hailstorm. This was really bad because it meant there was no food left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Israel. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt. They covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened. And they did eat every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. After a really bad plague, Pharaoh quickly called Moses and Aaron over. He admitted he did wrong by God and asked for their forgiveness. He also asked them to please ask God to get rid of the locusts. Moses prayed to God, and God made the wind blow in a different direction, pushing all the locusts into the Red Sea. Not even one locust was left in Egypt, but even after that, God made Pharaoh's heart hard again, and he still wouldn't let the Israelites go. The locust plague wasn't just about showing how powerful God is over nature. It was also a direct challenge to the Egyptian god Set, who was supposed to be in charge of storms. This showed that the God Set, who was all about storms and chaos, had no power compared to the God of Israel. The locusts, pushed by the wind, which could be something Set controlled, ate up everything. This left the land empty and made Egypt even weaker. Ninth Plague Darkness Ra, also known as Re, was a super important god in ancient Egyptian religion. He was the sun god, which meant he was in charge of life itself and creating everything. In the stories about him, Ra traveled across the sky in a solar boat during the day and went through the underworld at night. People usually showed him as a man with a falcon's head, wearing a sun disk and a sacred cobra on his head. Ra was a big deal in Egyptian culture. He was like the top god and was believed to bring light, warmth, and growth. In the story of the Exodus in the Bible, there's a part where God sends a plague of darkness to Egypt. This was a big deal because it was like a direct challenge to Ra, the sun god, who is thought to be the most powerful of all the Egyptian gods. Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. 
During all that time, the people could not see each other, and no one moved. There was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. God told Moses to lift his hand up to the sky. This caused a very thick darkness to cover Egypt. The darkness was so heavy that the Egyptians couldn't see anything at all. They couldn't even leave their homes because the darkness was too scary and thick. For three whole days, the super thick darkness covered Egypt, but where the Israelites lived, there was light. This difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites is super important. It shows how powerful God is, even more powerful than Ra, the Egyptian God that they thought was super important. It also shows that God was protecting the Israelites. The darkness made things really bad for the Egyptians, showing they were living without knowing God. But the Israelites had light, which means they were with God. When God made this darkness to show he was more powerful than Ra, he was showing he's in charge of everything, even the sun. Then Pharaoh told Moses that the Israelites could leave, but they had to leave their animals. Moses didn't agree to that. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. Exodus chapter 10, verse 26. But after the darkness lifted, Pharaoh's heart was still hard, and he wouldn't let the Israelites go. To set the stage for the final and most devastating plague, the death of the firstborns in Egypt. The story of the ninth plague shows how God was determined to free the Israelites and how Pharaoh's stubbornness led to more suffering for his people. It's a reminder of the power of God and the importance of listening to his words. Tenth plague, death of the firstborn. Before the last and most terrible plague, God had already sent nine plagues to Egypt because Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites, who were his slaves, leave Egypt. Despite how bad these plagues were, Pharaoh didn't change his mind. So, God planned one more plague that would be the worst of all. In ancient Egypt, people didn't just see Pharaoh as a king or ruler. They also thought of him as a god or a divine being. This idea was a big part of Egyptian culture and religion. People believed that pharaohs were either chosen by the gods or gods living on earth. This made it extra hard for Moses to get Pharaoh to free the Israelites. When Pharaoh said no, it wasn't just a political choice. It was also about his religion. Admitting the power of the God of Israel would be like saying he wasn't a god. The Bible talks about the tenth and final plague in Exodus chapter 11 verses 1 through 10 and chapter 12 verses 29 through 30. This plague was the saddest and most severe, causing the death of the firstborn in every Egyptian family, even Pharaoh's own child. Pharaoh was seen as a god, so this was a huge deal. The Bible gives details on this event and what God told Moses to do. God tells Moses about the final plague that will compel Pharaoh to release the Israelites. Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. Before the plague, God instructs the Israelites to mark their doorposts with lamb's blood. This act would protect them from the coming disaster, as God would pass over their homes and spare their firstborn. This event is known as the Passover, a significant Jewish holiday commemorating this event and the liberation of the Israelites. At midnight, the tenth plague strikes Egypt. Every Egyptian firstborn, from the highest in the royal palace to the lowest in the prison, dies. There was a loud wailing in Egypt because there wasn't a house without someone dead, including the house of Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 through 30 describes this moment. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of their livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. The death caused by the last plague was so terrible that it finally made Pharaoh give up, feeling very sad and scared. Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron in the middle of the night. He told them to take the Israelites and leave Egypt. 
He even asked them to give him a blessing as they went away. Exodus chapter 12, verses 31 through 32. The Israelites quickly packed up their things and left Egypt. This moment was the start of their journey to freedom. Jewish people all over the world remember this event during the Passover festival. The 10th plague was a key moment in the Exodus history and story. It showed God's power over all the Egyptian gods, including Pharaoh. It was the start of the Israelites' journey to freedom. This plague also showed how strong God is and how far he would go to free his people. It's a story about faith, listening to God, and being set free. It also shows what can happen when someone is stubborn and won't change their mind. In each plague, the story in the Bible shows how the God of Israel was more powerful than the Egyptian gods. Each plague was like a defeat for the God it was connected to. In the end, the ten plagues weren't just punishments. They were a way to show that the God of Israel was much more powerful than the Egyptian gods. Turning the Nile into blood was a challenge to the Nile God. Frogs challenged the fertility goddess Hecate, and darkness went against the sun god Ra. Each plague was aimed at a different god, breaking down the Egyptians' belief in their gods one by one. The last plague, the death of the firstborn, was a direct challenge to Pharaoh's status as a god. Through these plagues, God showed he was the only true power. This led to the Israelites being freed. The story highlights God's power, the importance of faith, and how the true God wins over made-up gods. Number two, God defeats Baal. The rumble on Carmel. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all the kings who were before him. Allow me to introduce you to the three main characters in this incredible Bible story. The first is Ahab, the king of Israel who did more evil than all the previous kings combined. The second character is Jezebel, Ahab's wife. She decided to replace the Lord God's worship with the sex cult worship of Baal. Baal was the name of the god who was worshipped through Canaan and Phoenicia in ancient times. During the judges' period, the practice of Baal worship entered Jewish religious life. The practice of Baal worship became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab, and the practice of Baal worship also affected Judah. The plural of the world Baal is Balaam, which means Lord. Baal was a fertility god who was thought to help the earth produce crops and people produce offspring in general. Various parts worshiped Baal in different methods, and Baal provided to be a highly universal god. Various locales highlighted one or another of his attributes and designed special sects of Baalism. Baal of Peor, as we see in Numbers chapter 25, verse 3, and Baal Bereth, as we see in Judges chapter 8, verse 33, are two examples of such localized deities. The word Baal appears infrequently in the Old Testament as a personal name. The word's etymology shows that Baal was considered as the owner of a certain location, thereby limiting its use to individuals who were no longer nomads but had settled down. These local Baals were thought to be in charge of agriculture, creatures, and humanity's fertility. It was crucial to win their favor, especially in a place like Pal, where there are a few natural streams or springs and rainfall is unpredictable. This led to the adoption of extreme forms in the cultus, including the practice of ritual prostitution and child sacrifice. Elijah, one of God's great prophets, is the third character. His name translates as Jehovah is my God. While Jezebel was destroying the people and places associated with the true God, the Lord sent a man whose name testified that the Lord Jehovah was his God. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 3. Go from here and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan River. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Elijah is used as an example of the power of prayer in James chapter 5, verse 17 and verse 18. A man with a nature like ours, James said, 
That means he was a regular guy. Elijah was a man of greatness, but he was also a man of weakness. But one fact redeems everything about Elijah. He was a man of prayer. James chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, with the same physical, mental, and spiritual limitations and shortcomings. And he prayed intensely for it not to rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its crops as usual. Not only did Elijah pray, but he prayed earnestly. The key to determining whether God is alive or not is hiding, as you learn to connect with God through earnest prayer. A series of events in Elijah's personal life demonstrated that God was alive. First, God dispatched Elijah by himself to the brook Cherith. Cherith means cut off or isolated. That doesn't sound so bad at first. Many of us would like to spend a day in the country, perhaps with a picnic by a brook. But Elijah was gone for more than a day. He was gone for nearly three years. He led the same ordinary humdrum existence day after day. The majority of life is routine. However, Elijah learned from the mundane experience that God provides in extraordinary ways. The ravens at Cherith brought Elijah bread and meat twice a day. The Bible instructs us to thank God as we pray for our daily bread, demonstrating that God is present in the mundane of life. If you can't prove God is alive there, you're probably not going to be able to prove God is alive anywhere. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. When the brook dried up, God transferred Elijah to Zarephath, which means to heat or smelt. God increased the pressure on Elijah. He sometimes raised the heat in our lives to refine our faith and make us strong for him. Number two, publicly present yourself. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Then Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the sources of water and to all the streams. Perhaps we may find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. He recognized him and fell face downward, out of respect, and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? He answered him, It is I. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. But he said, what sin have I committed that you would hand over your servant to Ahab to put me to death? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent messengers to seek you. And when they said, he is not here, Ahab made the kingdom or nation swear that they had not found you. And now you are saying, go tell your master, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I leave you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So, when I come to tell Ahab and he does not find you, he will kill me. Yet your servant has reverently feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to my Lord Elijah what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water? And now you are saying, go tell your master, Elijah is here and he will kill me. Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts, armies, lives, before whom I stand, I will certainly show myself to Ahab today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. 1 Kings 18, verses 2 through 16. Elijah then went public. He set up a meeting with King Ahab. Three years had passed since Elijah declared that there would be no rain. 1 Kings 18, verse 17. Then it happened, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? The king was still enraged and referred to Elijah as the troubler of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18, Elijah said, 
I have not brought disaster on Israel, but you and your father's household have by abandoning, rejecting the commandments of the Lord and by following the Baals. But Elijah was unfazed, telling the king, I'm not the troublemaker, you are. Now then, send word and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah, who eat at Queen Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word to all the Israelites and assembled the pagan prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah approached all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. But the people of Israel did not answer him so much as a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone remain a prophet of the Lord, while Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it into pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of the Lord your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people answered, It is well spoken. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, since there are many of you, and call on the name of your God and put no fire under it. So they took the bull that was given to them and prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh Baal, hear and answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied, or he is out at the moment, or he is on a journey. Perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. So they cried out with a loud voice to get Baal's attention, and cut themselves with swords and lances in accordance with their custom, until the blood flowed out on them. As midday passed, they played the part of prophets and raved dramatically until the time for offering the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people approached him, and he repaired and rebuilt the old altar of the Lord that had been torn down by Jezebel. Then Elijah took 12 stones in accordance with the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, Elijah built an altar in the name of the Lord made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he laid out the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet approached the altar and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back to you. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering in the wood and even the stones in the dust. It also licked up the water in the trench, and all the people saw it. They fell face downward, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. They seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon, and, as God's law required, kill them there. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 19-40 through 40. The stage was set for a showdown on Mount Carmel between 850 Baal prophets and one God prophet. How long will you waver between two opinions? Elijah challenged the audience. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Here was Elijah's dare. Let's have a competition. Let the God who is God respond with fire from heaven. This was a reasonable test. Baal, the storm god, should be able to send down some lightning. Elijah gave them every advantage before mocking their futile efforts. Baal's prophets spent hours pleading, shouting, and cutting themselves, but he didn't respond. 
Then Elijah prepared the sacrifice before asking God to show the people his glory. Fire fell and consumed the sacrifice, the water, and the altar as soon as he said his prayer. People fell to their knees yelling, the Lord, he is God, the Lord is God. They couldn't help but notice that God was alive and well. First Kings chapter 18, verses 42 through 46. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he crouched down to the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. Elijah said, go back seven times. And at the seventh time, the servant said, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And Elijah said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the rain shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew dark with clouds and wind, and there were heavy showers. And Ahab mounted and rode his chariot and went inland to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, giving him supernatural strength. He girded up his loins and outran Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel, nearly 20 miles. But the Lord wasn't done yet. He reactivated the rain spigot. Elijah prayed seven times in a row before the rain began to fall. Elijah, drenched, dashed down the mountain. He demonstrated that God is alive and well. God is alive and well. You can demonstrate it both privately and publicly in your life. Number three, God defeats Dagon. Yahweh defeated Dagon. It involved the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented a key symbol of the Jewish faith and God's presence among them. Inside the ark were the stone tablets of the Mosaic law, a jar of manna, and Aaron's staff. The sacred chest has its origins in Exodus, where God expressed a desire to dwell among the people of Israel. No one could touch God's holy mountain and survive, leading Moses to construct a barrier at its base. The giving of the law was marked by thunder, lightning, and flames, underscoring God's immense power and his distinction from humanity. Yet. Despite emphasizing his transcendence, God instructed Moses to create a space for him to reside within their encampment, indicating his wish to be at the heart of his people's lives. For its transportation, the ark was designed with four golden rings, two on each side. Poles made of acacia wood were slid through these rings to carry the ark. These carrying poles were intended to be a permanent addition to the ark, always remaining in their slots. The name Ark of the Covenant stems from the covenant represented by the commandments on the tablets. Moreover, the Ark was central to several significant events. For instance, it safeguarded the Israelites as they entered the Promised Land via the Jordan River and played a pivotal role in the victory at Jericho, as detailed in the book of Joshua. In the story found in the book of Samuel, the Ark falls into Philistine hands, leading to a perception among both the Israelites and the Philistines that God could be captured by the enemies of Israel. This occurred after Israel faced defeat in an initial encounter with the Philistines, resulting in the loss of around 4,000 lives. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1-2 through 2. And the word of the Lord through Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle, and they camped beside Ebenezer when the Philistines camped at Aphek. The Philistines assembled in battle formation to meet Israel, and when the battle was over, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. The Israelites find themselves puzzled by their recent defeat, deducing that their misfortune was due to not bringing the Ark of God into battle viewing it as a sort of powerful talisman that could ensure their victory. With renewed confidence, they engage in battle once more. Meanwhile, the Philistines, though initially terrified by the prospect of facing the Ark, confront the Israelites, fearing defeat or death. Contrary to their hopes, this battle results in an even more devastating loss for the Israelites, with 30,000 of their foot soldiers perishing, including the two priests, Hophni and Phinehas. To the human eye, it seems as though the Philistines have managed to capture God himself, turning the tables on the Israelites. The Philistines and the God in the hands of God. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 
Then the Philistines took the Ark of God, and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it beside the image of Dagon, their chief idol. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and returned him to his place. But when they got up early the next morning, behold, Dagon had again fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord, and his head and both palms of his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk portion of the idol of Dagon was left on him. This is the reason neither the priests of Dagon nor any who entered Dagon's house step on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. It's easy to picture the intense excitement and joyous celebrations among the Philistines as they take the Ark of God from Ebenezer to Ashdod, one of their five main cities. In their view, beating the Israelites and seizing the Ark equaled defeating God himself. They likely brought the Ark into the temple of Dagon one of their chief gods with great pomp. There, the spot meant to show it was lesser than Dagon. The Ark of God was placed. To the Philistines, it seemed as if Dagon had triumphed over the God of Israel, just as they had triumphed over the Israelites. But they were about to experience a startling surprise the very next morning. Troubled by tumors. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. Then the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he caused them to be dumbfounded and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. When the men of Ashdod saw what had happened, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. So they sent word and gathered all the lords, governors of the Philistines to them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought about to Gath. So they took the ark of the God of Israel there, but it happened that after they had taken it to Gath, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing an extremely great panic because of the deaths from the plague. For he struck the people of the city, both young and old, and tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out, they have brought the ark of the God of Israel from Gath to us, to kill us and our people. So they sent word and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel. Let it be returned to its own place, so that it will not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly panic throughout the city. The hand of God was very heavy, severe there. The men who had not died were stricken with tumors and the cry of the city for help went up to heaven. In the temple of Dagon, God demonstrates to the Philistines that their deity is powerless before him. Now, God turns his attention to the Philistines themselves, challenging their perceived victory. The statue of Dagon is found with its hands broken off, a clear sign that the hand of God was at work. The presence of the Ark in Ashdod brings a severe plague upon the city and its vicinity, showcasing the heavy hand of God upon them. The nature of this plague is not specified, but it's evident the Philistines are desperate to be free of it. Acknowledging that the affliction in Ashdod is a direct result of housing the Ark of God, the Philistine leaders decide to pass their problem to Gath, another of their cities. Predictably, the plague strikes Gath following the Ark's arrival. The decision is then made to send the Ark to Ekron, but the people of Ekron resist, understanding all too well the calamity that follows the Ark. The situation reminds me of a child playing old maid, desperately not wanting to be stuck with the unwelcomed card. Ekron's rejection of the Ark signals that no Philistine city is willing to host it, leading to its return to Israel without any need for military or diplomatic efforts, seven months after its capture. The Philistines clearly recognize that the plagues affecting their cities are the result of the Ark's presence, understanding it as divine judgment against them and Dagon. However, their response is not to renounce their idol worship or to turn to the God of Israel. Instead, their solution is simply to remove the source of their troubles, wanting God and his ark out of their cities, putting the ark in its place. 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now the ark of the Lord had been in the country of the Philistines for seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, 
seers, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Let us know how we can send it back to its place. They said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty without a gift, but be sure to return it to him together with a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What shall the guilt offering be which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the Lord's governors of the Philistines. For one plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you shall make replicas of your tumors and of your mice that ravage the land. And give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand of judgment on you and your gods and your land. Why then do you harden your hearts, allowing pride to cause your downfall, just as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had severely dealt with them and mocked them? Did they not allow the people of Israel to go, and they departed? Now then, make a new cart and prepare two milk cows on which a yoke has never been placed, and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves back home, away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart, and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a guilt offering in a box beside it. Then send it away without a driver, but watch. If it goes up by the way of its own territory to Beth Shemesh, then you will know that he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us. This disaster happened to us by chance. And the men did so, and took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart, and corralled their calves at home. They put the ark of the Lord on the cart, and the box containing the golden mice and the replicas of their tumors. And the cows went straight toward Beth Shemesh, along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn away to the right or to the left. And the Philistine lords, governors, followed them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the men of Beth Shemesh were gathering their wheat harvest in the valley, and they looked up and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A large stone was there, and the man split up the wood of the cart for firewood and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites had taken down the ark of the Lord and the box beside it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices that day to the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines saw what had happened, they returned to Ekron that day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron, the five chief cities of the Philistines. Also the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and unwalled country villages. The large stone on which the Levites set the ark of the Lord remains a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. The Lord struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck down 50,070 men among the people, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. The men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up from us? So they sent messengers to the residents of kiriath Jeharam, saying, The Philistines have returned to the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. So the men of kiriath Jearim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated Eleazar, his son, to care for the ark of the Lord. And from that day, the ark remained in kiriath Jeharam for a very long time. For it was twenty years until the reign of King David, and all the house of Israel lamented, wailed, and grieved after the Lord. For seven months, the ark of the Lord seems to be in captivity, during which time the Philistines suffered greatly from the severe judgments of God. Finally, it becomes evident that the only viable solution is to send the ark back to Israel. The pressing issue becomes, how? initially treated as a political concern and shuffled among the Philistine cities in chapter 5. The ark's presence proves too burdensome for any to bear. Now recognized as a religious dilemma, the Philistine priests are consulted on the proper method to return the ark without further provoking the wrath of the God of Israel. In seven short months, the Philistines had gained a good fear of the ark. The Philistines decided to give back the ark they had stolen by putting it on a wagon with some golden sacrifices. 
The wagon halted in Joshua's field beside a massive rock. The Levites took the ark and put it on the rock, presenting sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord.